It now gives me great pleasure to, to introduce our speaker this evening. Kieran Derrick Brown is passionate both about invertebrates, especially earthworms, and about recording. And he's the current chair of the LNHS Ecology and Entomology section. He's also the recording officer for the Earthworm Society of Britain. He verifies all earthworm records on iRecord and created the iRecord tax and specific form for earthworms too. In addition, he's helped a number of local groups set up their own iRecord activities, including a central London church, the Barbican Wildlife Garden and our own London Natural History Society. So he's very well placed to talk to us about LNHS iRecord. So it's over to you now, Kieran, thank you. You're on mute, Kevin. Yeah, I knew that. Uh, <laughs> hello, everybody. Welcome to my talk. Um, I'm going to talk today about iRecord and LNHS together and how we're dabbling in uh, the use of iRecord and how it can hopefully benefit our recorders. So I'm going, I'm going to talk to you about that today. Um, before I start, a little caveat that I have no investment in iRecord or anything like that. So I'm just trying to sell it to everybody because, because I actually genuinely love it so much. Right, so what I wanted to start with is, I've just realized I can't see how to launch a poll from here. Yes, I can. So when I first did this talk, I, I did it for the FSA and I, I asked the people that were attending the talk a couple of questions and I've got the results there. I want to start by asking you guys a, a couple of questions. So you should see a couple of questions launched there. If you could let me know if you've submitted biological records before, and the options are yes regularly, yes but only occasionally, or no. And if you've used iRecord before. Uh, so I want to know whether you're a regular user, whether you've used it occasionally, or no. And that will tell me whether I need to completely skip through the first part of the, the talk, uh, or whether I need to give a bit of background into biological recording. And it's gonna be half and half, isn't it? Just, just, just to make it a little bit tricky. Right, okay. Okay, I'll just give you a couple more minutes. Anybody else still to respond? Five, four, three, two, one, right. So I'm just gonna share those results. So it seems like we've got a real mix in the, in the group today. It looks like when it comes to submitting records, we've got 44% are regular recorders, so brilliant. So I apologise in advance, the first part of the talk is going to be teaching you to suck eggs, I'm afraid. Um, but we've got 36% uh, and 21% that either only record occasionally or haven't recorded at all. So I just want to give a brief introduction to biological recording and why it's important. With regards to iRecord, I can see that very few of you are regular users, which is good because what I'm aiming to show you today is extremely um, basic. Just bear with me one second. Somebody's doing some very loud gardening and I didn't want that to disrupt the, um, the sound. Right, okay, so that's good to know. Let's stop sharing that and get on with the talk. So, um, what is a biological record? I'm gonna, I won't spend too long on this, but just to introduce the concept, when, when we're talking about biological recording, we're talking about the scientific study of the distribution of living organisms and biological records describe the presence, abundance, associations and changes, both in time and space of wildlife. That's a bit of a mouthful. What we really mean is the bare bones of a record are who, what, where and when. So the who being the recorder, who recorded it, the what being the species, the where being ideally a grid reference um, and not just the name of a street on the back of a fag packet, and the when being a date, ideally. So when we're talking about these four basic components, we can be talking about them in different resolutions as well. And that, that's important to be aware of. So a record can be low resolution or it can be high resolution and we can have low resolution aspects of all of the, that who, what, where, when, or high. So an example low resolution record would be where we've just got a record of say a bird in, on Hampstead Heath in 2019 by the RSPB. 
that tells us pretty much nothing, to be honest. Uh, what we're really looking for when we're talking about biological recording are a species name, um, preferably within a, a one kilometre grid square, even better resolution if we can, down to 100 metres or 10 metres, a date, specific date, so we can see what season and, and link things like weather and etc. to it, and the individual that recorded it. The individual is really important because it allows us to go back to that person to clarify any points and gather extra information. So bare bones of a record are who, what, where, when. But there's also another couple of questions and they are how the record was gathered and um, what the record, why, the, the why. So what is the record telling us about um, nature and, and the species? So other things that we might want to record might be the method that was used to find the organism. That tells us a bit about where it is. So you can see bums in the air there um, with people looking for, what are they looking for? I think they might be looking for, ah, they're looking for beetles. Yeah. Uh, the, we might want more information about the habitat because obviously um, different organisms have different associations with habitats. We might want to know the number of organisms that were that were recorded that tells us about populations and the life stage um, for things like caddis flies, mayflies, dragonflies is really important as well. So this is the kind of information we're talking about when we're talking about biological recording. So why is recording important? Why do we even care? Why do we want records? And I mean, this really comes back to the, the core of what LNHS are about. Why do LNHS want people to submit biological records. So there are a number of reasons, but if we go to the very basics, if we don't have biological records, then we don't really know anything about our wildlife. So here you've got a distribution map of the common cardivate on the left, if we use biological records. And on the right, we've got the same species mapped out if we have no biological records. This may seem like a really obvious point, but when we're talking about really common things uh, that we take for granted as well, we don't know if there are changes to their distributions if we have no data. So it's important that we record anything and everything in my opinion, to be, to be honest, so that we don't have blank data when we see that things are starting to change and uh, something is becoming much more abundant or even going less abundant and possibly extinct. So the first thing that biological recording tells us and the most basic thing, so when you're starting up a recording scheme like we did in 2009 with earthworms, the very first thing we want to know is, is a species present somewhere or not? Um, so that's before we can start looking at conservation states or anything like that, is it just present? And before the recording scheme was launched in 2009 for for earthworms by the Earthworm Society of Britain. This was the data that existed for all at the time, it was 29 species of earthworm in Great Britain. So as you can see in that map, Wales is a desert when it comes to um, earthworms. And there are big patches all over the country where we have no data about earthworm distribution whatsoever. And it, again, I'll stress this is all species. By 2017, we, this is what the distribution map looks like for all species of earthworms. So in eight years with a recording scheme running, that's the, that's the difference having an active um, recording scheme can have to our knowledge. We still have huge gaps as massive areas of Scotland and Wales that we still know very little about whether there are even earthworm present or not there. Obviously there will be earthworms, but we, we definitely can't start drilling down with species, etc. Once we've got better quality presence absence data, the next thing we can start looking at changes over time. So trends in species distributions. So the maps here you've got are from the state of the UK's butterflies in 2015. And the map on the, the both maps have two sets of data mapped on them. They have the, the data from record of records from 1970 to 1982 we, uh, in, in purple. And then where we've got 
records for areas where they haven't been um, recorded before from 2010 to 2014 they've been mapped in orange and what this tells us is, is it allows us to play with the data and it allows us to start saying hang on we, we can say a bit more about these species now and we can see that they're they're actually moving and that may be for example to do with climate change it may be to do with changes in land use we can start looking into that but this this demonstrates why atlas work is very important so a very good example is we've got the london butterfly atlas project underway at the moment where we we've been gathering data for a five-year period up until last year and we'll be comparing that with an earlier atlas we did um, uh, before the millennium i can't remember how far back it might be in the 80s even um, but we can look at the changes and that's how we start telling some of the interesting stories that are behind the biological records and the, the wonderful wildlife that we have in London and across the country. It's not just about maps though, it's not just about putting these dots on maps. When we do statistical analysis of those biological records, we can start looking at species um, population trends over time. Uh, the Bat Conservation Trust have done some fantastic work uh, with structured monitoring schemes which gather biological records and mapping out uh, and graphing out the population trends for, for those species. So from biological records, from surveys here, we can see that the greater horseshoe bat is recovering, which is great because it's historically its populations were much, much bigger than they are now. So yeah, it shows us that the conservation efforts that were undertaken and the legislation that's in place to protect greater horseshoe bats is working. So they also help us track invasions, um, a threat to the UK and, and obviously around the rest of the world at the moment is inv uh, non-native invasive species. So biological records can be mapped one species against another to see how those species are interacting. So here we've been able to map um, red squirrels against grey squirrels, see where the overlap is to see how the, the non-native invasive uh, grey squirrel is affecting our native red squirrel populations as well. Right, so a quick question, and I'm going to come back and look at you all for a second. Uh, I want to know why you believe wildlife, recording wildlife is important. So it'd be good if people can just drop why they record in the chat so that I can get an idea of what it is you want to get out of your biological recording. Um, there is no right or wrong answer. It might be that you do it for fun, it might be that you do it for a local site, etc. but it'll be interesting to just see the reasons behind why you guys record. So if you just drop your answers in the chat, and that might be something that we can come back to a bit later. Okay, so, yeah, so Jeff there is saying he, he likes to submit data so that we can monitor changes, especially species decline. Uh, Jenny is saying that she is interested in contributing to citizen science projects, so it allows her to contribute to some bigger scientific study. Um, oh God, now it's gone crazy. Um, Keith would like to know what is seen and when, and he, he does it for other organisations so that they can put the data to good use. Uh, Liz wants to know what's happening locally. Uh, yeah, Pete to, Pete to contribute to wider knowledge. Uh, I think Pete probably also likes data to know how to manage the sites that is responsible for across the rural parks. Um, and yeah, general interest in wildlife, local parks. The point really is that there are lots of reasons why people record. And although people are putting one reason down there, it may be that people are actually contributing data to a number of sources for a number of reasons. And I think it's important as a society and as recorders that we remember that a lot of people do recording for a lot of different reasons. So actually getting our data out there and making it accessible to as many different organisations and people that can use it as possible, for me personally, I think is really important. So that brings us on to the topic for the day. Why? I record. So not why do I record, because we've just covered that, but why should we 
consider iRecords. So this is where my sales pitch on behalf of BRC, who I'm sure are going to give me a job in the future, um, kicks in. So I thought we'd start with what is iRecord because there's a lot of misconceptions about what iRecord is. I think the first thing to point out is that iRecord is a free tool. It's, it's not for profit. There's no advertising on the platform and there's no, no commercial use. It's not collecting your data to use it commercially. It was created by an organization called the Biological Record Center. And they were a government agency that was set up to support the national recording schemes and societies. So their agenda with iRecord was to support people submitting records and to enable the national recording schemes to gather records in one place. It's particularly useful at the time for gathering records where we've got a recording scheme like Earthworms, where there's just a single person looking after the whole thing nationally. So, and I think that's, that's really important to remember. It was set up to support the recording community, not to make profit, not as part of a funding, uh, funding bid, etc. It had a very specific goal in mind. So I've got another question for you now, and I'm, not, I'm gonna keep this screen up while I do it. Oh, it keeps disappearing. I would like you to tell me which you think is the odd one out. So let me launch this. Everybody has to vote. Don't worry about getting it right or wrong because there are different ways you can look at it. But if everybody can vote right or wrong, like what they think is the odd one out there. And we'll see if you agree with my logic. All right, come on. We've got 29, 30, 33. I've only got 48 of you. Come on, as many as possible. A few more. We've got a clear winner, by the way. Nobody's picked our naturalist yet. Keep going. Anybody else? Right. I'm going to stop the poll there. Last chance to vote. It's anonymous, by the way. I can't see who's getting this right or wrong. So you've won 80% Instagram, 0% iNaturalist, 12% iRecord, 7% iSpot. So there are 12% of you there that I consider to be correct, and you, you've all passed the test. Um, the odd one out there is iRecord in my eyes. And the reason for that is when you look at these four platforms, the thing that I instantly see that they all have in common is, or they all have in common except iRecord, is that you need a photograph to submit a post to them. So Instagram, you can't submit a post without a photograph. iNaturalist and iSpot are basically the same thing. They'll probably go mad at me for saying that, but they're tools where people submit a photograph of, a, um, of an organism or some wildlife and they state, sometimes they state what they think it is, sometimes they'll leave it blank and other people go in and agree with them or disagree with them. And um, so it's crowdsourced ID. iRecord does not need a photograph. iRecord is all about um, submitting a biological record and you can submit a photograph with it but you don't have to. So the point I want to get across here and a common misconception is that iRecord is not about photos. Photos are a tool that can be used on it. So for those recorders who say I don't like iRecord because you can't ID my group from a photo, that means that you've misunderstood what iRecord is because a photo is an optional extra that can, that can sometimes help with verification, but not always. So to clarify with that, what iRecord is and what iRecord is not, iRecord is not a tool. It is not something that is all about identifying things from photos. It's also not a recording scheme. So it was set up for those recording schemes. What iRecord is, is it's created by a non-profit organization and it is essentially a recording form. It is much more than that, but the way that, the thing that I like to try and get across to people is that iRecord is a tool for collating your data, submitting it and putting it through a submission, a record submission process. And iRecord is accessible to any national recording scheme that wants to be involved. They're able to access the data on there. 
and they will be the ones that decide what the verification protocol is for that data and they'll be the ones that will decide whether or not records can be passed as verified or, or will be rejected. So what I record is also not, is it, it's not in competition and it is not a local environmental record centre. So it's not a repository for biological records. Yes, biological records are, are on there, but it does not replace the record centres. And not all record centres get data from iRecord, but all record centres are able to get data from iRecord if they so choose. So both Giggle and Heart Environment Record Centre, which I've mentioned here, if they want to download data from iRecord, they are able to access that. However, there may be other issues as to why they might not do that. Um, for example, they might, they might find it hard to manage duplication or they might, there might be issues around how they perceive they can use it. But my understanding is that they can use it for their, the purposes that, that they would use it within a record centre. So what I record is also not is an alternative for the MBN Atlas. The MBN Atlas is a tool that is used for holding biological records and making them uh, publicly available. So I record is a tool for getting records to the MBN Atlas rather than being a replacement. Right, so we've covered what I record is and what it is not. Um, bear with me one sec while I just double check what my next question is. No, that's fine, it's not for a while. Oh, can you all still see my screen? Yep. So why iRecord? So I'm going to give you four reasons why I think we should use iRecord or why recording schemes and recording organisations should use them. So the first is data validation. So for those who aren't aware, data validation is making sure that the data that we get within a biological record is within a standard format. And that's important because otherwise it's really, it's really time consuming to bring lots of data together. And if we give a very basic example, which a lot of people might not think about, is if I give you my birthday so that you all know when to send me a card of the 4th of July, this is just some ways I thought that the, that piece of data, the 4th of July, could be submitted to me. And each one of these is in a different format. What iRecord does when people submit their data in, they, they can only put it in in a set format. If I was getting data in an Excel spreadsheet, it could come in any of these formats. Um, it, could even, yeah, it could even be fully wrote out as 4th of July 2019 all in words. So what iRecord will do is make sure that that is validated into one format. It will make sure that, and it will not accept an incorrect format. So if I tried to submit a date of the 45th of July 2019, it wouldn't accept that. So that's the first service that iRecord provides. And a lot of other, um, all other online portals will provide that service as well. But it's, it's a benefit to the recorders and the people managing the data. The second thing that iRecord um, provides recorders and societies like LNHS with is a submission pathway. So one thing that a lot of recorders I'm aware get fed up with is a different way of submitting records for every group that they, I, that they record for. And that's, in a way it's fine when you record specifically for just a small number of groups, but if you're a generalist who'll do a little bit of everything, you don't want to be keeping 46 different spreadsheets all in different formats for 46 different groups and recording schemes. What iRecord does is it allows all that data to be funneled in through one system and the various recording schemes can, if they choose, engage with that data within that system. So iRecord gets it to, an, to a national recording scheme, but only if there's an iRecord verifier for that scheme that's volunteered to, to deal with the data. The third thing it provides is a verification service. So iRecord, there's a load of verifiers signed up to iRecord to look at the data and figure out whether things are right or wrong. Now those verifiers are usually vetted and go through the national recording scheme. So a good example would be myself, I do all the earthworm data for the UK, but if we look at, the, at botany, for example, uh, the botanical world has county recorders. So it might be that on iRecord, the county recorder for 
um, the Middlesex Vice County would actually be the Middlesex Vice County Recorder if if they were engaging with the platform. So what when I talk about veri verification, again, I've used an example here with a photo. So we can see here uh, that record on the left can be verified as we can see it's a nursery web spider. The record on the right would be either reje rejected or redetermined because it's not a common frog, it's a common toad. However, that's not what verification has to mean in iRecord. Verification can be a county recorder accepting all of the records from a recorder that's known to them, whether or not they have photos assigned to them. So the verification protocol that is an, that is utilized by the specific verifier will be specific to that recording scheme and, and maybe even that verifier. So as an example, if anybody would like to see an example, uh, if you Google earthworm record verification, you'll see on the earthworm site of Britain, we have outlined our verification protocol that we use um, which is what we use on iRecord, but also with academic institutions when we're getting their data as well. So that's the third tool that that uses. And for an organisation like LNHS, this is a real opportunity for us to tap into national verification systems. So, for example, if somebody puts a record of a um, an obscure beetle group, into iRecord where, the, where there's, a, there's a verifier for that dealing with it nationally, that national recorder will look at that record, get in touch with the recorder if needs be and figure out whether it can be verified or not. And then they'll mark on the record at what, le at what level it's been accepted. So it means that LNHS is able to access a verification service that would just be beyond the scope of the society if we weren't going through this platform. So it's particularly good when we don't have recorders for, for a specific group, but there's one already using their record. And I think the fourth thing I'd like to mention that I, won't, that I think is often overlooked is it allows a platform for the recorder that is submitting the record to personally collate their records. And again, I mentioned that there are people that will record lots of different groups. It allows them to be able to keep all of their records in one place and access it. Now I'm aware that's a bit of a problem when you've got historic data, but it means that iRecord is particularly good for the new recorders that we've got coming in um, for in encouraging, yeah, encouraging them in. Okay, so what happens when a record goes into iRecord? So we start off, we've got uh, Maria Roberts here has seen an owl with some binoculars. Um, and she creates her record by writing it down on the back of an envelope. She then gets home and she submits the record uh, through her computer um, with her who, what, where, when, and that goes into iRecord. Um, at the point of submission, it goes through an automatic validation by the, by the iRecord platform where it, it won't let her enter the letter P in the date um, and it makes sure that the species name is correct. It won't allow you to enter an, an incorrect species name, for example. And that creates a biological record that is unverified, so it's not being assessed. That will then, because let's say there's an owl recorder that is looking at those records on iRecord, it then goes through a verification process. And again, that can be automated if the recording scheme wants it to be. So it might be that the recording scheme will accept all records of barn owls because they trust that people will not get it wrong. Or it might be that you've got an individual or a team of people asking questions of those records. Um, and that, again, that could be that they're just checking to see whether the person has, uh, is somebody that they know, or it might be that they're asking actual questions or asking for evidence, like a photograph or a specimen. And then that record will, will either be accepted or not accepted based on the decision of the verifier. So that's the iRecord record journey. Um, a little bit in terms of stats. So why should we use iRecord and not one of the other platforms that are out there? iRecord, when I checked this in spring this year, I recorded 713 registered verifiers, some local, some national, some extremely active, some less so. 
Um, but the point is that that's 713 volunteers that are going through records and verifying them. You won't get that on any other system. Um, it's got 9,393,848 records. So that's an incredible number of records on it. So there are already a lot of people submitting a lot of data there. And it makes sense for us to try and move towards one system within the biological recording sector. The more data that is created, the more we need to be organized with managing that data. Of those records, 5,163,303 have been verified. So that means we have over 5 million really useful records. What it doesn't tell us, I'm not sure if I've got that there, anybody? No. What it doesn't tell us is whether the, so of those records that are not verified, some of them will have been rejected and some are records that have never been looked at. So there's a mixture of the two. But if you were wanting to look at reliable data, there's five, over 5 million reliable records that can be pulled out and, and have been, have went into various recording schemes, etc. We've got 260, over 266,000 registered users. So this is a platform that is being used by many. And this is important for organisations like LNHS to take heed of, because if a lot of people are already using it, if we don't engage with it, we're going to miss out on their records because some of those people are not going to submit to various organisations. Um, so it's important for LNHS to engage with it. And I think the last part I'd like to mention on, on the stats is it's a significant contributor to the MBN Atlas. So the number of records that have gone through our record and then ended up on data sets on the MBN Atlas is very significant. So um, a little plug here from my day job, I'm designing a online course about iRecall, which we've trialed, but this will be coming soon. So if you're interested in learning more about biological recording and how to use iRecall, then uh, this online training course will be available in the near future. Uh, feel free to drop me an email um, at um, you can even come through the virtual talks at lnhs.org.uk and I'll pick that email up and I can uh, put, let you know when there's information about that coming. Um, so finally, LNHS and I record. This is the point I wanted to get to. Um, LNHS now have an I record activity and we have 21 registered users, registered recorders on there, which we can see here. So yeah, 21 registered recorders, and we've got 690 records. This is not something that we've pushed. So we've got 690 records just from putting it on there. Um, what I would say to our recorders is, if you have an established way of submitting your records through an LNHS recorder, don't change that. But if you're a botanical recorder who sees the odd mammal or the odd, um, grass snake, whatever, but you don't submit those records to the individual recorders at LNHS. Maybe it's worth submitting them through the iRecord um, platform, specifically the LNHS app, which I'll show you in a sec, because then I can make sure that those records get to the relevant recorder. So to give you an example of um, how this can help us and where we've got problems with this, in the ecology and entomology section, we have a large number of recorders who are each responsible for a different taxonomic group. And we all record each other's groups, but we're not the best, I hold my hands up, I'm guilty of this, of sharing our ad hoc records with each other. So our mammal recorder, Clive, is forever complaining that he gets very few mammal records. So I want to ask you a question. It keeps disappearing every time I hover over it. Uh, bear with me one sec. All right, here's another poll. How many of you, you can, you can select as many as you've seen, have seen the following mammals in your garden or local park? So I don't want to know if you've recorded it, just if you've seen it. So yeah, vote away. If you've seen none, I assume you can submit an zeros across the board. Right, okay. 
Yeah, a little bit, a little bit more. We've only got four views at all. People like it when I'm asking them what they've seen. <laughs> right, okay. So let me share those results. So Clive, who gets very few mammal records, we've got 39 out of 40 of you have seen grey squirrels in your garden or local park. Three of you have seen badgers, 39 have seen foxes, 14 have seen hedgehogs. So that's 78, 81, 95 records we've got there, 95 species records, assuming that you've all only seen those things once. Yeah? Let's see what we've had on the iRecord thing for mammals. So when I look at mammal records through iRecord, so these are records that I can pass on to Clive, I'm assuming that very few, if none of you, are specifically mammal recorders in the, um, in the call today. We've had three hedgehog records, eight grey squirrel, six foxes, and zero badgers. So this gives you an idea of how few records are coming into us and how unable we are therefore to comment on the distribution and what's happening to these these animals so what i would stress here is if you're seeing the odd fox or the odd hedgehog gray squirrel or badger in your garden signing up to iRecord and submitting these records through the lnhs iRecord app really helps us because it allows us it allows me to pass this information on to our mammal recorder and our mammal recorder is unable to make meaningful comments about what's happening to mammals in london unless he has that data we talked right at the beginning about how it's a blank map without the data so that brings me to the end of the presentation what i'm going to very quickly show you is how easy it is to submit a record through iRecord. And I saw a wood pigeon on Sunday. I made a mental note of that. So here we are. When you, when you log on to iRecord, this is the screen that comes up. To submit a record so that LNHS get access to it, you have to do it through our iRecord activity. Otherwise, it would be available to the recording scheme in Giggle, but it wouldn't be available to us. So if I go down here, I've got the LNHS activity. I've got a number of forms I could submit here, including some species specific ones, but I'm just gonna enter a casual record, which I can enter a record of anything through this. So when I click on this, this form comes up. Um, I saw it on Sunday, which was the 13th. Uh, my name's already in there. It was a wood pigeon. So I can type in the common name or the, um, the scientific name and it should come up. I'm certain filling the certainty in allows you to tell the verifier how confident you are with your record. I don't know what sex it was. It was identified by me. Yep, I saw one was an adult. I didn't take a photo, but I would assume if somebody is verifying bird records that they would they would probably take a wood pigeon one anyway. And um, right now I need to find where that record was. It was in my back garden, so I can breach GDPR here because it's my own personal information. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in my postcode and I'm going to find it that way because I, I didn't take a good reference. So if I go there, Oh, and then I zoom in. For those who don't know, I live in Harrow. And then as I zoom in, it should switch to satellite. I can see a bit better. And now I need to find my garden. My garden is, told you I'm going to breach you, GDPR is here, but that I don't want to go that fine because it was in my garden. So I want this whole big square here. Which is there. And when I click on that square, it will fill in the spatial reference. So to allow any verifier to know that I've got the right spatial reference, I'm also going to put the name of the street. I'm not going to put my full address, uh, but the name of the street. And it was in a garden. And then I can submit that. And that is how easy it is to submit a record 
that now, if there is a bird person for London going through the data, they'll be able to get that. What I can also do is download the data as the manager of the LNHSI record activity at the end of the year, and I'll send all that data on to the um, to the bird recorder for uh, for that vice county, um, and that is the end of my talk. So I think, Maria, are we going to open it up for questions? Of course, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you ever so much, Q. And I like the way that I featured, my, but my bar now record featured in that. I, that was a bit unexpected, but I like that. I thought it was a lot of interaction in that talk and, and really like clearly and well presented. Um, I, just before I go to questions, I was just shocked about how few mammal records we ha that we have, that it was, uh, given how common particularly like the fox and the grey squirrel are. So I think the, the chat has been quite active. So that we'll, we'll, get, we'll have some questions from there. Do, don't forget, you can kind of raise your hand if you want to ask the question in, in person as well. So um, David, if, have you picked up any questions from the chat yet? Yeah, I've got one or two, which I'll, I'll put to you to Kieran whilst we're waiting for people if they want to wave their hands or come in otherwise. Um, so we had a question from Suzanne Bins, um, which is really about recording. It's ever. When you're looking at distribution, how do you balance the distribution versus gaps in recording rather than a lack of presence, was the question. Okay, so I leave that up to the statisticians of BRC. That's how I handle it. I see the role that I take within my recording scheme and the role I see, I see myself undertaking as chair of E&E is to encourage more people to submit records and to try and get those records in. But there are clever algorithms that can be used to, to clean up that data. And for example, I was contacted by the Biological Records Centre regarding a paper that they're doing where they do exactly that. So if we can get our data to those data scientists, they can then clean that up. But the best way we can address gaps in data is to record, 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 and get as much data into the system as possible. Uh, if you've got loads of data, it doesn't matter how variable the quality is, a data scientist can figure out how to claim that up. I'm not worried. Yeah. And when, when we have that data, then we can see where the gaps are. Uh, it might be that there are gaps in, record, in recorder effort. If they are, what we can do is target where those gaps are and have field trips to those sites that look like things are missing and check to see if... if the organisms that, that are missing from there are actually missing, or whether um, it's just because nobody's looked at it before. Thank you. I think there's quite, there seems to be quite a lot of questions coming through now, there's quite, David. There's quite a few questions going through. I've got, I've got a back, I'll try and do the order of the camera. So the, the, um, okay. there was, Mark Gord had a question. Mark, what, uh, Mark, do you want to unmute yourself and ask? I was just wondering if people, let's see what the question was. If anyone has been using it in the, in a bad way, like putting in like uh, something that doesn't happen, where we get, oh, I'll go to a question again. What did I say? I said, what happens if someone lies about their fine? Do they get banned and not be able to use the services again? And has it happened often? Well, so so part of that would be the verification process. So if people are putting records in. The records that will automatically be accepted without any real um, verification will be records that are, that are of common things that are easy to identify where allowing the record into the big data set won't really have a big negative impact. So that's a, the first part of that. If somebody is going to submit a record that's incorrect, then hopefully that will come out in the verification process. I'm not aware too much of people lying about records, but obviously when we think about planning applications and things like that, then there, there can be some incentive for people to do that. But I think a lot of it's gonna be taken on trust. There's only so much so much we can, we can do. It, if a record seems like it's wrong, the verifier will start asking questions and then, and then they might ask for proof of that record. So, as an example, um, it might be if a if a bat roost, uh, uh, if an enthusiast pipistrelle bat roost was being record was being submitted, it might be that the the bat recorder 
the London Bat Group would ask for a evidence of the of the sound analysis that they got that from, for example. Uh, so, Kieran, there've been, there've been a, a, several questions about the iRecord app and the various scheme-specific apps related to it, um, what they are, how they work, and how whether we get the data. So, LNHS only gets data from the LNHS activity. Um, it might be that, uh, and that's because we're, people are going specifically through that activity. The way I record is set up, the priority is the rec national recording schemes, which is sometimes it's a county recorder that that's going through to get to the national scheme. So it would still get to the county recorder. But with regards to the apps, the, there are I record butterflies app, the, there's a mammal app which goes through the same kind of system as well. All of these apps are, are set up by the recording schemes for, for those groups. And LNHS wouldn't get that data, but at least the data is going into the system. So it wouldn't be the end of the world. With the, the general iRecord app, that is just a mobile platform version of the the website version, the, the website I record that I showed you, it works a bit differently, but what you can do on that is you can, if you play around with the settings, you can set it up so that records that you're submitting are going into a specific activity. So I have my phone set up. If I use the iRecord app, so if I, I see a toad and I quickly snap a photo of it and I send it in through that, uh, it will automatically go into the LNHS activity. So you can set it up that way. LNHS currently has no plans or no desire, I think, to get into app development and, and building its own LNHS iRecord app. It's a lot more hassle in my eyes than it's worth. Um, but yeah, okay. Thanks. There, there are lots more questions coming in. We may not get to all of them, but yeah. I, will, I will try and do a few more. Um, so there have been a couple of questions about things on the iRecord data. So da data that's on iRecord already can it be transferred to our activity um, and where records have not been given the green tick which i guess is validated and verified um, are they usable so <laughs> the recording schemes can access all of the data for their for their groups that they manage and lnhs can access all of the data for any that goes through the I record, uh, the LNHS I record activity, so we can we can download the data and it will just say on that record what the verification status is, whether it's not been looked at yet or whether it's been confirmed. And if it's been confirmed or if it's been looked at, who did that? So what the name of the verifier is. So the data is accessible to to those organisations. In terms of can anybody get that data, iRecord lets you play around with the data online, but it will only let you download um, specific chunks of data. So it'll let you download your own data, though, your own records that you've submitted. Um, and it might depend on, I think it depends on how the activity is set up as to whether if you're part of that activity, you can download all of the data within that. Um, what I will say is iRecord, in my eyes, is a tool for collating data and submitting it to organizations. It's not, a, it's not necessarily a tool for really um, interrogating that data. That tool is the NBN Atlas. And the NBN Atlas has its own strengths and weaknesses, but I think the, the place where we, within the sector where data should end up as a repository is the NBN Atlas. And, whether that's easy to use or not, that that feedback would need to go to the NBN directly, <laughs> other than me. <laughs> yeah, there had been a couple of questions at the NBN Atlas, so I, I'll yeah. try and pick them up. One was, um, there's, uh, there, there's some rumours on the that the date of the NBN Atlas doesn't always get to the local record centre. Um, and I guess, is that also true for the iRecord data? Um, and, I think uh, on, on, on that point, what I'll just say about data flow is we've got the recorder submitting data to iRecord to get it to the recording scheme, essentially. Now, the LERC, the local record centre, 
can get the data from iRecord if they want to. And then it's then up to the record centers and the recording schemes whether they submit the data to the MBN Atlas. When we're talking about data then going back down, once data is on the MBN Atlas, it's publicly available. It'll have a Creative Commons license um, applied to it, but it, the MBN do not send data to anybody. They are a repository for data. They receive data and they make that available. So if data is not flowing from the MBN to a record center, that is because the, re the record center are not downloading data from the MBN and incorporating it into their data set. And that might be to do with capacity of the record center, or it might be to do with the Creative Commons license that is applied to the data, the specific data that they're not downloading. It might be that because they use the data in a way that is considered commercially, it might be that they can't download a specific data set and use it because it's seen as commercial use because they're, they're obviously getting money from consultants, etc., to interpret that data. So, okay, thanks. I hope that clarifies. It it, uh, it could be another 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 in itself. Yeah. Um, a, a question here from from David about sensitive species. Um, what is well? I, I guess two words. What what is done about blurring the data for sensitive species? If someone had you know a species of say a, a sensitive bat roost, um, and can you see your own locations? Uh, can you see your own data precisely, even if you if it's blurred for the general public when you're accessing it? Okay, so I'm sharing my screen again so you can see. What, when I went through that record, there's a box here about sensitive data, and you can tick if the record is sensitive and you can blur the record to um, a certain uh, resolution, so a 10 kilometer square if you want. The blurring will occur publicly, but the, 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 the recording scheme, my understanding, is will have access to the full resolution of the record that you provide. So there are two ways that you can deal with this. If you want the record to be available, uh, you'll be able to see it, I would imagine. I've never done this myself, so I don't know, but I would imagine you'll be able to see it as, as the record owner to its full resolution. If you don't want anybody to have it above a certain resolution, including the recording scheme, you should enter the record at the resolution that you want it to be available to those org organisations at. If you want to make it... A, available to the recording scheme at the full resolution, but you don't want it to be people to be able to publicly view it because it's sensitive, then you would use that sensitivity tool. So, and I would always advise speaking to the relevant recording scheme about sensitive data and what their advice is, because they'll have specific advice for, for their groups. Uh, right. We've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I'm sort of yeah. slightly randomly picking questions because there's a lot. Um, Jenny Shalom's asked, what's the best way of submitting a record when you, well, well, when you haven't got an ID, specifically when you don't know what the insect is, but you've got a photo? So that, for me, that's not submitting a record. What you need is ID help. So the best thing you can do is bring it along to an LNHS field meeting when we're running them, show it to one of our, our um our recorders because they have a wealth of knowledge and we can maybe help you get to the bottom of it face to face. Obviously in the in the new world that's not possible. So there are a couple of things you can do. Firstly you can take a photo of it and you can submit it to there's loads of Facebook groups that are really good including the LNHS uh, or London Natural History Society forum it's called. Um, so you can submit a record there. It's actually one of our September activities to submit records there. Uh, uh, to submit photographs there. And if our recorders can give you any advice, uh, um, uh, um, the members of that group, then they will. They're a friendly bunch. The other thing that you can do is this is where tools like iSpot and iNaturalist come in handy. So when you submit your photo to those platforms, there, there is an element of, um, you can submit it as a, I don't know, or it's a general insect, etc., and people will give an opinion. Um, so that's what you can do with that. I record is for when you have a species ID. If you're 
a little bit unsure about it, then you would submit it through iRecord still and just put that you're uncertain. If you if you select that uncertain option, the recorder knows that they might need to ask questions if they can't determine for, uh, what it is from the photo. I think the important thing as well to remember from photos is it's not possible to identify everything from a photo and even things that it's possible to identify from a photo, it's not possible to identify them from every photo. So it can be, it can be a bit of luck, a bit of hit and miss when you're taking a photograph of a bee, for example, some species can be ID from a photo, some not, but where they can, the photo normally needs to be at a very specific angle or it needs to be a series of photos that capture a, a variety of um, morphological features for, for somebody to be able to confirm your record. Right. Hopefully that yeah. helps. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Kira. Well, well, we're going to have to call a halt now because it is 7.30. I know there are still some uh, kind of like unanswered questions, but I mean, there are always you could put those questions into the LNHS Facebook forum, for example. Um, so, uh, you know, but, but great. It's been really active. I like there's been such a lot of interaction. I like the way people have got so involved in the chat and you know, really engaged engage with the talk. It's been great. Thank you ever so much, Kira. And I think everybody's really enjoyed that and found that very informative. So thank you everyone for coming. Our next talk, our next virtual talk is going to be on the 1st of October. It will be Ben Harris and it's an introduction to reptiles and reptile identification. It is very, very popular already. I will let you know. We have got, so at the moment it's sold out. Um, we've got a waiting list, so if you are interested in it, please put your name on the waiting list because we're, we're looking at seeing whether we can actually increase the capacity. So don't kind of despair, it might still be possible to attend, but obviously every, I hope a lot of you have already signed up already. Please see our website for details of all of our forthcoming talks. You can sign up to our mailing list there and also consider joining the society because as Kieran says, we're very friendly and we also have got a lot of expertise. So I hope to see you again soon. If you would like to unmute yourselves to say goodbye, you can, or you can just give us a wave. But thank you ever so before, much for coming. Before anybody goes, I've got one request. Can you all please submit a basic mammal record next time you see it through the NHS yes. I record activity because that's yes. how I sell it to the rest of the recorders. Yeah, no, I'll definitely do that myself. Thank you very much.